Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is so good to be in the house today. And I would just say this, if you've been newly added to the family church, you are blessed with some amazing, amazing pastors and their family. Uh, you don't see it very often where a family is in ministry, and you saw Britt up here singing. I mean, I remember when Britt wasn't even a thought. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. Who knew he was going to be the tallest miller other than Pastor Jay? But it's true. But nonetheless, man, we are so glad to be here. Thank you. It is so good to see many of you, so many of you that we have had moments with and relationship with. I look over here, and I see people from Lafayette. I see people from Thibodeau. I see you, James Boatner. Don't hide from me. But nonetheless, so good to be here with you, to be able to kind of share the Word of God with you this morning. And I really believe that God laid something on my heart for you guys this morning that has really just kind of ministered to me over the last couple of months. Uh, as Pastor Jay said, I pastor a church right outside of the Nashville area, uh, just about 15 minutes north of Nashville, a great area. It's an amazing place. Uh, it ain't South Louisiana, but it's close. Come on, somebody. If you, if you don't, can't live here, you might as well live somewhere like that. And uh, it's just been fantastic to be able to do pursue the call of God on our lives and, and allow God to use us uh, in, in those areas. And we look forward to just every opportunity we get to come back to South Louisiana eat boudin. Come on, somebody. It's like, oh my gosh. Like, I look so forward to the, 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 the Cajun cuisine. Obviously, our parents are in the Baton Rouge area. But this morning, I want to jump into a couple of verses that several months ago I was reading, and these verses just kind of stood out to me in a way that I probably hadn't seen them in a while. Uh, you know, that happens from time to time. You can be serving the Lord, reading the Word, and, and spending your time, and all of a sudden, something jumps out to you kind of in a way that you've never seen it before. And I, I had this happen to me on some verses found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I want to read these to you this morning at the message translation because it really spoke to me in this translation. Uh, and the way it speaks and the way it's worded, it just really fit for the lives that I believe that you and I are all wanting to live and we're wanting to see progress and be successful in. Every single one of us has desires to be successful. For instance, if you have a child that's playing a little league or whatever it is, you want them to be on the team that's going to win. Uh, it's funny because I got some pictures yesterday at my sister's house that my mom recently had passed a few years ago. My sister had all these pictures, and she handed me this folder full of pictures, and it was the picture of me playing peewee football. I do not believe we won one game ever the whole entire three years that I was on that team. And so, I, you know, but if your kid's going to play, you want them to have successful moments. It's why people put, my child is an honor roll student at LCA on the back of their car. They, they want to be proud. They want to succeed. And I believe there's something on the inside of us that we all want to be successful in every area of our life. You don't want to just be married today, amen. You want to really have a great marriage. You don't want to just have some finances. You want your finances to be blessed. That's why we give. That's why we operate in obedience to what the Word of God tells us because He says, hey, I'm going to rebuke the devourer on your behalf. And so I saw these verses a little different and applying them to our everyday lives. Because how many of you know the everyday living life that you and I are all involved in sometimes can be difficult? Sometimes it can be problematic. Sometimes it can be very confusing because there, there are different stages and different seasons that you find yourself in and going, wow, I wasn't really ex ex thinking this was going to go this way, so now what do I do? And this, these verses really help kind of put some things into perspective. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, and going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God, notice what it says, as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. I will have to tell you, I have been stuck on these verses for several months now. And seeing them in this light, it really kind of brought me to, the this, this basically to me was a modern day description of what an altar really looks like. 
Now you say, when you hear the word altar, most of the time we want to go back to the Old Testament and we want to think, well, there was a place in the Old Testament where they would sacrifice animals and there was worship going on. There were all these things that were taking place there, very the rule-oriented. They had to be done a certain way. But I saw this a little different because it's interesting to me that whenever you look at what's going on here, this is what God tells you. He says, I want you, wherever you are, whatever season of life you are, wherever place you work in, however many kids kids you have, however much money you have, I want you to take your eating, sleeping, going to work kind of life, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to place it on the altar. I want you to bring it to me in every facet, in every form, and give it to me as an offering to me, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to develop some things in you. I'm going to pull some things out of you that are so deep and so amazing that the world really can't affect it. It really can't change it. It can't stop it. I mean, when I saw it in that light, it kind of reframed some things to where for you and I as believers, I believe this is the secret sauce if we're going to be successful in the life that God calls us to live. Now, over and over, I find that there's so many things that I believe that we, and when we see the relevance of, and we understand that, you know, this altar that we kind of reference in this moment, we kind of find these different things that are applied to our life. We find the power of God there. We find deliverance there. We find all these different things that are going on. But one of the things that I have found to be very true in pastoring people and living for Christ myself is one of the biggest things that we often struggle in serving God completely completely in living the life that he's called us to live is based on the things that happen to us and around us. How many of you would say that in life right now, you may have a certain need in life? Come on, let me see your hand real quick. It, it, you know exactly what it is. It's, it's big to you. It means something to you. It may not be something to somebody else, but for you, this is a big area. It could be a struggle. It could be a, there could be all kinds of things. It could be something on the outside. But here's the thing that I really believe that when you and I are talking about needs in our life, it usually happens because it's something that we can't fix ourselves. If you could fix it, you would. If you could understand how to, to navigate around it or through it or, or go, go over it, you would do it. And you find yourself in those moments. And here's the thing that I believe. We all experience those times. I'll give you an example. Rachel and I were in White House, Tennessee. We had lived there for about seven years. We're pastoring the church. I would tell you that things were going amazing, but in a pastor's life, things kind of go like this all the time. It's just one day's a good day, the next day's not so great. I had a, somebody one time come to me at church. This is what our lives look like sometimes. I had a lady come up to me one Sunday. She walked up to me. She says, oh, Pastor Derek, can I talk to you for a second? I said, yes, ma'am. I just finished preaching, sweating, spitting, the whole deal. I gave it all I had. She says, oh my gosh, you are like fine wine. You get better with time. That was the best sermon I think I've ever heard you preach. The next week she was going to another church. Never came back. Never came back. And I'm like, and I remember telling my wife, maybe I didn't understand what she said to me, but I thought it was a compliment. I really did. Like, I didn't understand, like, the, the connection there. I thought it was real strong, your greatest message. See ya. Like, it just was interesting. And, and it was just it's something that we had to process. But I remember another moment for us that happened. We were pastoring this church and just moved away from South Louisiana. All our great friends, the Millers, and, and our family in Baton Rouge, and many of you that are here. And we're living in, in, in Tennessee. And come on, we live in a land where they don't wear purple and gold. And I don't judge them because they don't know no better. And every time I wear my purple and gold, they make comments. And I'm like, bro, it's okay. Everybody hates a winner. It's all right. That ugly orange that y'all got, keep wearing that. Maybe y'all will win in 20 years. But nonetheless, nonetheless, we were passing the church, doing life, and just, you know, doing what everybody else is doing. We have you know, kids in high school and junior high, and all the things are going on. And one day we bring our middle son, Zachary, who I said was here a couple of months ago to the eye doctor to get some glasses, kind of a glasses prescription refilled. And I'm at the office and my wife calls me. She says, hey, what are you doing right now? I said, I'm in, in my office. She goes, hey, can you come up to the doctor's office and right down the road? And uh, he wants to talk to us. So we go over there and I meet Rachel and Zachary there. And the doctor proceeds to tell me some things that were larger than me. Some things that I really didn't understand how to approach. I didn't, I never really thought about it this way, never considered this, but he informs us that my son at 16 years old has an eye disease that 
It's degenerative and there's absolutely no cure for it and they don't know what to tell me other than this is what's happening. And, and I remember the moment, I remember sitting in that doctor's office thinking, like, wait, what are you, what are you telling me? Like, what, 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 do you, what do you mean he's got an eye? Disease? Like, what's going on? Like, he played football and he played basketball and he was involved in all these things and it didn't seem like there was a problem at all, at all. And I remember the, after that moment, going back to my office and sitting there and just, it was like somebody took the wind out of my sail. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to respond. I would love to tell you that a big man of faith and power, I got my Bible out and I, I rolled out to something. I'm like, ooh, yeah, this is the verse I'm going to stand on. But I'll be honest, it took me a, a little while. As I'm sitting there dwelling on this over the next couple of days, I'm praying and just my heart was broken. I'm thinking, what in the world's going to happen? And all these fearful moments were coming through my mind, like, what is he going to do? And will he find somebody that's going to want to marry him? And, and what's all the things? And my goodness, if y'all saw Mally that was here a couple of months ago with you guys, she's like a Disney princess. She's amazing. God knew exactly what he needed. And, and it's, but I remember sitting there thinking, I don't know what to do. This is a huge need, and I didn't even know it was going to be a need, but it's a huge need. I can't fix it. I can't throw money at it. I can't just talk my way out of it. I needed God. I needed to understand what to do and how to respond. And it was in this moment that I realized, guess what? I'm going to need to get in God's presence. I'm going to need to get where he is. And if that means I've got to go to an altar to pray, then that's what it's going to take. If it means I've got to shut my, my doors to everything else that's going on, then I need to do that. But I've got to get with him, and I've got to understand I've got to take this everyday life this ordinary life that I'm living and I got to bring it to him and say God I don't know how you can do this but God here it is and I'll be honest with you in that season I had to be very careful because I'll never forget having a meeting with somebody <laughs> that had come to the church and had been there for a little while they wanted to have a meeting with me in that season and they came in and were complaining about the church how we were doing things and what they thought we should be doing and the things that were happening that they thought were ha should happen and were not happening. And I literally almost gave him the keys and said, hey, maybe you ought to be the pastor of this church because that's where I was. I had this huge need in my life and I didn't know what to do and I didn't know how to respond. I was, I was struggling with it and it was almost like God brought me to some of these moments that we're talking about today. This, hey, Derek, you're gonna have to learn that even in this season, you're gonna have to bring your life to me. You're going to have to let me be God in your life. You're going to let me be God in this situation. You're going to have to let me show up and do some things even in this moment. And I'll, I'll kind of share with you what's, what's happened with him over the, the course of time. But it's amazing. But throughout God's word, I started looking at things and came across a story that many of you have probably read that kind of, re, kind of reminded me of how do we approach moments when we have huge needs? How do we approach life if we want to be successful? How do we do some of these things that we hear? often and it was very practical and found in first Samuel chapter 1 it's a very interesting story in verse 1 it's a story about a girl by or a lady by the name of Hannah each year the Bible says Elkanah her husband would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven's armies at the tabernacle they were going to the church house they were going to the family church on Sunday morning that's where they were going the priests of the Lord at that time were, were the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. On the day Elkanah presented this sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to Penaniah and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So let me stop for a minute. In this day, I don't really understand why a man would need two wives or could handle two wives. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. But this is what's going on. One of these wives has multiple children, and she was receiving these gifts and these things and these moments that were great, while this other wife that he had, Hannah, whom he loved dearly, had no children. So she would just get one portion of, of meal and, and, and meat and all the things that were going on. And the Bible tells us it goes on. It says this, so Penaniah, instead of being the good godly person that we all think that, hey, everybody's supposed to be, would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Notice this, year after year. Come on, look at your neighbor say, year after year. That's a rough statement if things aren't going well. Year after year, the Bible says here, it was the same. Penaniah would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and wouldn't even eat. 
Here's, listen to this. It says, why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than 10 sons? That's a dumb dude right there. I mean, seriously, like, I don't know that I've heard anything more ridiculous. Like, I mean, can you just, I mean, I know we think that way, but we don't say stuff like that. Come on, baby, I'm a blessing to you. You got me. I, I could have chose anybody, but I chose, like, that's how this dude is right here. Crazy, crazy thought right here. But nonetheless, that's not my message. Hannah's in the middle of this moment of life, have this huge need. And let's be real, nobody seemed to understand Nobody seemed to feel it. Nobody seemed to be taking up her cause or helping her navigate through the moment. It was probably more of this. One more confusing moment after one more confusing moment. One more difficult thing after another difficult thing. And here's the thing. Her desire was so deep, but here's the truth. So was her pain. And so it kind of started speaking to me as I was reading this story because I went to this moment and, and started thinking of moments in my life, moments possibly in your life that are very similar, where you've hit a roadblock or you've hit a wall or a Goliath, a giant in the land, whatever it may be, and people around you don't understand. They don't understand why you're still going to church. They don't understand why you do the things that you do because they're not walking in the same shoes that you're walking in, but they're looking at you. And in this day, you have to understand that this this was not seen as, oh, she doesn't have any kids. She actually was seen as being cursed. She was seen as there was something wrong with you. That's why God has not given you children. And so we find her in this very painful moment. But the thing that so struck me and it so spoke to my heart was this, is you don't see this individual that is up one day, down the next. Up one day, down the next. Hey, I love God today, but I'm mad at God because he hasn't given me what I need, what I want in my life. And it just kind of, it kind of was it's just kind of messing with me a little bit because truly that might be one of you in here today. You're showing up week after week and your needs are unmet. The things that you've been praying for haven't happened. You've got huge pain in your life. And it's like, you're looking, you look really good this morning, but inside you're masking it because there's deep hurt, there's deep pain. And the thing that I realized about this, this story was this, it spoke to how we live. And it spoke to how I really believe that you and I can be successful in bringing our lives to God and being that living sacrifice or that offering to him. And I really believe it's this. Number one, if that's you today and you've got huge need because at the altar, it was a place of worship. It was a place of sacrifice, but it was also a place where God met man and huge, huge needs are met. You would see that all the time in the Old Testament, there were these moments where God would come through and they would erect a monument or an altar so that their kids would understand every time they walked by, hey, this is where God did what he did. Their grandkids could see it. Their great grandkids kids could see it. And all the generations beyond them. But here's the thing that I believe. What you, if you and I are ever going to be those kind of people that can walk with God and experience him every single day of our life, number one, we're going to have to, number one, find our way. We're going to have to find our way to the altar. We're going to have to find our way to his presence and understand that he's our source. He's the one that helps us. He's the one that does things on the inside of us and around us. And so here's the question I would ask you this morning. What do you find yourself tending to do when life deals you heartbreak and disappointment? Because do you realize Jesus told his disciples as they were leaving on the mission that he had called them to for their life, he told them, hey, listen, Hey guys, before you go, here's what I need you to understand. You're going to have many trials and many sorrows. He didn't say one. He didn't say an occasional. He said many. Now, I know this to be true, that the longer you live, you will find many moments of trials. You will find many moments of sorrow. But here's the thing. In those moments, what do we have a tendency to do? We usually throw our hands up and quit. I'm done. Like I've been believing God, I've been trusting God, I've been giving, I've been doing this, I've been worshiping, I've been praying, I've been reading, and it's not happening. And the enemy says, hey, if God was that good, then he would have showed up by now. How about this one? If you were right where God wanted you to be, then he would have already done the things that you say he's going to do. But there must be something wrong with you, just like Hannah taunting you and messing with you and telling you, hey, you're not going to experience what you believe that you're going to experience. And here's the thing. We often have these questions in our painful moments. 
And see, many have that tendency to throw up their hands in frustrations and quit. And the Bible clearly tells us, one of my favorite passages is Galatians 6, verse 9. It says, so let's not grow weary in doing well. For in due season, we'll reap the harvest if we don't quit. Now, I have had to be reminded of that as a dad. I've had to be reminded of that as, as an employer or an employee. I've had to le- remember that in moments of pastoring a church. Just like I said, when that guy came in my office and I'm dealing with all these things, I literally wanted to quit and say, I'm done. I've moved my family 10 hours away from everybody that I love to go to a land that is different than everything that I understand. I'm going to tell you right now, when it starts snowing in Tennessee, I question every time, God, did I hear your voice? I got snowed in this past year. My wife, we just had a brand new grandbaby a couple of months ago, and it's, he's amazing, River, he's awesome. And, and my wife just happened to be at River's house when the snow came. Y'all, it snowed like eight inches overnight. I woke up, I walked outside, I said, uh-oh. I mean, I'm from Louisiana. I don't know about y'all. I didn't grow up playing in the snow. I didn't ever have a sled. I didn't know how to make snowballs. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know how to dress for the snow. I remember the first couple of times we walked out into the snow in, in, North, in Tennessee. It was, I froze to death. And somebody says, you know what your problem is? You don't have a coat. I said, what is this? That's not a coat. You got to do this. And so I had to learn but here's the thing that I believe for all of us, for in all the moments that we experience, I was in that moment watching this snow, and I'm thinking, I don't know if I miss God or not. This is craziness. I think I was stuck in the house for four days, and she was gone. And I was there with two golden retrievers, looking at them going, why do y'all smell so bad? What's going on? What's happening here? It was just rough. It was just rough. But here's the thing that I believe for all of us. We all have moments We want change. We want blessing. We want something to happen. But yet the reality is Hannah saw no change year after year. Let that sink in because oftentimes we think, man, I prayed once and I should have had enough faith to believe that it would happen and it happened. And here's the thing. There's a blessing I find in consistency and obedience in our lives that we don't get from just about anything else. And see, maybe you're walking through something today and you say, man, I've got this huge need and God really isn't seeming to come through, but I'm continuing to bring my life to him and read his word and come to church and worship and do some of the things. And I don't want to be fake, but I'm trying to continue to walk this out. And so the first thing that I find is that you've got to find your way to the altar. You've got to find your way to his presence. But two, number number two, you've got to do this. You've got to place your pain on the altar. And it's so interesting because do you realize that God looks at you and I and he knows that we have issues. He knows that we have shortcomings. He knows that we have problems. And what he wants us to do in those moments is he wants us to invite him into it and allow him the room to work and to speak and to operate and to move. It's kind of the same thing I have as a father. I have three kids and they all live in Alabama. I pray for us. Please pray for us. They all live in Birmingham and Auburn and these places. And, and you know, what I want, what Rachel and I want is this. We want to be invited into their moments. We can't force our way in. They're adults. I can sit back and think, man, I wish he would ask me. I wish they would ask me. But until they invite me, I keep my opinion to myself. And here's the thing that I believe God wants to be invited into our moments. And what we've got to do is even in those difficulties and those things, we've got to remember 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, cast your cares on me. Because here's the deal, I care for you. Even though you're walking through some things, I've already told you, you're going to walk through some things, but I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. And see, even though these moments aren't easy and they don't often go away quickly, what we need to do is keep bringing them to the altar of God, keep getting into the presence of God. And I have found very honestly that the extent of our pain many times will dictate how long you and I need to be in his presence. Consistently. You know, if there's a word that I think any person in Louisiana that's grown up in Louisiana understands more than anywhere else in the country, it's the word marinate. I mean, seriously, guys, like, I, if there's some things that are good, but they're even greater when they've been marinated just right. And man, we go in, in certain areas and certain moments in Tennessee, and I mean, that got good country music. I give that to them. But they don't have the kind of food we got here at all. 
And so it's like, man, it's got to have the right ingredients. It's got to soak. It's got to get in. It's got to get deep on the inside. And I just kind of pictured that sometimes I think that's what we need to do in the presence of God. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? you got to come to church every Sunday. I will tell you emphatically, unapologetically, you should be in church every Sunday. we going to be here. Well, I'm not going to be here, but I'll be in Tennessee. Your pastors are going to be here. There's going to be people that are here. And you say, why do I need to do that? You need to marinate. Because at some point, your life is going to go on the fire. And at some point, some things are going to be turned up. And what's inside of you needs to come out. And doesn't that, come on, I'm telling you, it's the truth. It's the truth. And I love that Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where it says, God's going to place things on the inside of you that's going to come out of you. And can we be real? The world is always trying to put stuff on the outside in us. And what we've got to do is have the things, the right things on the inside of us that will come out when we need it. So I love this because I had to to encourage myself in this. And see, I call this process, if you will, this altering moment, uh, alteration. How many of you know that alteration, is, it's a really interesting process. Uh, I've got a, I'm, I'm not bragging, but I've got a 32-inch waist and about a 22-inch this way. I, it's the way God made me. I, have, I have, didn't have a choice in it. My son is as tall as Pastor Jay. He's got a 32-inch waist and like a 97 this way. It's like, uh, it's unbelievable. And so he wears a pair of pants two times and he throws them in a the bag and he's like, I'm getting rid of all these because I'm like, no, you're not. Those are coming to me. I paid for them. They're brand new. So I get these clothes and I bring them to get altered. It's pretty embarrassing as a grown man when you bring somebody a pair of pants and they got to cut this much off of it to make them work for you. But that right there, that's alteration. And let me tell you that there's some moments that God wants to cut out of you. There's some things that God wants to sew up and change and change the trajectory of it. Make it work better. Make it work better than if you just left it alone. And see, this process for me is something that's so powerful for us that we shouldn't be the kind of people that that skip around it and say, well, I don't know if that's necessary for me. I had to tell my church a couple of months ago, hey, guys, up here, this area, this is not hot lava. Like, you could come up here and worship. You could come up here for prayer. If we call, hey, listen, and you raise your hand, and all these hands go up, hey, let us pray with you, and three people come up, I almost want to go get them before they get in their car. Whoa, 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 you raise your hand. Did I not see you? Hot lava, get down there. But there's moments that I'm telling you, we don't get what we need to go out in the world unless we spend time here. We don't get the things that God wants to do in us, prepare in us, and use us in if we don't get in his presence. And it's so necessary because the world has got so many things that they're looking at us and they're looking for people that live the life. And it's not just talk. It's just not Sunday talk. It's every single day. It's what Romans 12 says. I want your everyday life. I don't want your Sunday life. I want your everyday life. And to me, even as a pastor, I have to remind myself, I go to a church every single day of my life. Every day. Even when I don't want to. Come on, y'all know, because some of y'all are here and y'all didn't want to. And y'all saw me preaching, y'all, oh, I definitely don't want to be here now. That's okay. I was a youth pastor. I used to see it whenever they get up and walk out when the youth pastor was speaking. I got you. I want the pastor to preach today. I don't want this dude. Like, who's he? He don't even know me. He don't even know. But here's the deal. For you and I, I really believe with all of my heart, if we can get in his presence, things change. Your mentalities change. Your responses change. Your your actions change over the course of time being in his presence. See, the third thing that I noticed about this girl, Hannah, is not only did she continue to bring her pain and continue to go into being God's presence, was this, she kept asking. Come on, I think personally, and I didn't say this in the first service, but I think we need to be like junior hires when, when they ask for something. Come on, I ain't looking at nobody, but do you ever have a junior hiring? I remember being in junior high. Here's how I'd ask my mom. Mama, can I go to the movies? No, um, you're not going to be able to. Mama, please. No, no, it's not. It's not, that's not what, no, not doing that. Who's going? Nope, you're not going. Mama, mama, please, please, mama, please, 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 mama. mama if, if you just let me go one time, I promise I'll never ask again. Come on, y'all remember those days? 
And you say, do we have to beg God? No, we don't have to beg God, but I do believe that we need to keep our requests known unto him. Keep bringing our needs before him. It's, 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 it's in the word. As a matter of fact, we are, all, we are encouraged and invited to go to God in prayer. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Look, that's awesome. That's prayer. That's worship. That's honoring God. Then you will experience God's peace. Come on. That's a great word. I, you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds everything. Anything we can understand, and his peace will guard our hearts and our minds. And listen, as we live in Christ Jesus. Wow. I, 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 when you see it and when we understand it, and here I've had people ask me, well, Pastor, if God knows what we need, why do we need to keep asking? I really believe it's kind of this. The person that you ask first really reveals who you trust the most. The person that you keep asking really reveals who you trust in those moments the best. So why not go to the one who created the universe and spoke the stars into the sky and says, hey, why don't you bring your needs to me? Why don't you bring them to me? See, we've got open access to God through his son, Jesus. And Hannah did this. She kept, I mean, can you imagine year after year getting ready? Hey, we're going to the temple this week. And she's probably thinking, I don't want to be made fun of. I, 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 this hadn't happened. I've been praying. I've been believing. And it goes on. This is an amazing story. I got to preach fast. Listen, listen fast this morning. Here's, here's the thing. I believe number, number four, you've got to approach correct. Listen, we can't approach God in this lazy kind of, kind of no big deal kind of attitude. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Or how about this? You can't approach God in an entitled mentality. Hey, I've been coming to church and you better do this. And I quote a scripture and it better happen. You you better understand that even if you study the altar, and I didn't talk about this in the first service, but in the in the altar times, in the in the the tabernacle moments, do you know that the priests would enter the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, like this? He would crawl in with bells on his robe. You know why he had bells on his robe? With a rope tied around his waist. Because when the bells stop ringing, dude is dead. Because there's no flesh that's going to glory in God's presence. There's no sin that's going to be able to be allowed there. And so truly, I find that there's such a humility and understanding. God Almighty wants to talk to me. I don't just walk in and go, God, you're my homeboy. No, no, no. It's God, thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you for giving me audience today with you. God, I love you. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the things that you've already told me are true for our life. And I love how we find this, that Hannah found this moment where she was approaching God and she was so focused on getting what God wanted for her life because God had placed it in her heart. Here's the thing. She approached it correctly. It goes on in verse 9. Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting in his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you'll look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He'll be yours for his entire lifetime and as a sign that he's been dedicated to the Lord. His hair will never be cut. After, as she was praying to the Lord, Eli, come on, the pastor was watching her. Now you got to catch this. He was watching her on the side and the Bible said that her mouth was moving and no words were coming out. He didn't go over there and lay hands on her and let me, sister, let me pray for you. (laughs) Look at what he says. He says this, hearing no sound, he said, this girl's drunk. Come on, you want to talk about church hurt? There's some church hurt right there. Pastor's like, "He's, he's judged me. I mean, come on, it's interesting. He goes on. It says, you must have come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I'm very discouraged, and I was pouring my heart out to the Lord. See, she was coming to God over and over and over because she understood Psalm 66, where it says, for I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. If it not confessed my sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. And see, for us to have moments in his presence, there has to be a right spirit. There has to be a right approach. Let me help you with something. When you and I come to God, sin should be something that we get rid of. And listen, we we don't like to talk about sin today. We say things like this. Hey, pastor, would you mind praying with me? I got this struggle. Pastor, I got this problem. I got this issue. 
When's the last time you heard somebody say, man, I got this sin in my life, and I need freedom? See, that's what this freedom conference is going to talk a little bit about. I don't know exactly how that's going to look that week, but I know this, that the information that they are teaching you is things that will help you grow in your relationship with God and experience him fully. This is so powerful. And here we find that Hannah got this moment with God. She let nothing stop her. She let nothing hinder her from being in God's presence and making her request known to God. And lastly, I got to quit. Come on, y'all stand. I promise I'm stopping. The last thing I noticed about this story is she got right connection in agreement. Eli responds in verse 70. Come on, y'all stand. I promise I'm stopping. I promise. Y'all got to help me. Help me stop. Help me stop. In verse 17, it says, in that case, Eli said, he's already told her, You've been, you're drunk. He said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request that you have asked of him. Okay, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they remembered, excuse me, returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea. And in due time, she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel. For she said, I asked the Lord for him. It's an amazing story. Because we find that in this story, God gives her this beautiful baby boy. And she takes care of him for a season. And here's what in this day, what that meant was this. She was going to drop this baby off with the priest and say, he's God's forever. If you brought small children, please don't leave them here at the family church. That's not the message today. Take them home. Love on them. But teach them who God is. Show them who he is in your good moments. Show them who God is in your bad moments. Show them when you're on the top of the mountain or when you're in the bottom of the valley. Show them the reality of what serving God looks like. It looks like taking everything in your life and saying, God, here it is. My dreams, my plans, this huge need that I can't fix unless you show up. And God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust you until I see change. I'm going to keep bringing my needs. I'm going to keep bringing my pain. I'm not going to let anything stand in the way. I'm going to come to you with the right heart, with the right spirit. And let me help you with something. Listen, God can handle you in all your moments. He already knows who you are. You say, well, I've been frustrated. I've been angry. I've been disappointed. And here's the thing that I would tell you. And God has loved you every single moment and every single minute. You say, well, why hasn't it happened? I don't have answers for all those things. My son isn't healed from that, that eye thing going on. I don't even like to call it a disease. Because here's what happened whenever I told him, hey, what do you want us to do? We want to pray and fast for you. He said, he just looked at me and says, God's going to heal me. It hadn't happened yet. But here's the deal. I'm praying weekly about his eyes. I'm praying that the rods and cones of his eyes come back to life. I'm praying for a miracle. I don't care if God uses the doctors to do it. Praise God. He said, well, you should be able to lay hands on him. The faith of a righteous man avails. Yeah, I understand all that. And listen, we're praying all the time. But I do know this, watching my son serve the Lord. Lift him up every single day in worship. Not a perfect guy, but man, he's kind of hard after God. All I can say is this. You're going to go through some painful moments. And even if you came in here with big needs, I want you to understand we serve the God of the impossible today. There's nothing that he can't do. And you might say, well, why hasn't he done it? All I can say is keep bringing your every day going to bed eating and sleeping life and bring it to him as an offering lay it at his altar every single day and say God I'm living for you today speak to me work in my life use me and I believe with all of my heart when we do that God will get honor he'll get praise he'll get glory and I just believe this that he will show off in your life So this is the last thing I'm going to say when your pastor gets up here and preaches or one of the pastors on staff gets up here and preaches and says, hey, something like this. Hey, let us pray with you. Come down to the hot lava. Let them pray with you. 
And if you're driving in your car and you feel like, hey, this is a moment for God, I mean, put on some worship music or shut the music off and have a moment with God. If you're cutting your grass and the Spirit of God is laying something on you, then worship Him there. Spend time with Him there. If you're folding Him clothes, fold Him clothes in the Holy Ghost. Come on, just get them all just right. Like, listen, I'm telling you, you say, does that work? I'm telling you what it does for me. I'm telling you what it does for me. I'm still pastoring a church in Nashville, Tennessee area, and I've many times wanted to quit. And all I know is I just have to say, okay, God, I'm bringing it to you today. I'm bringing these people to you today. God, I'm bringing this person to you. I'm bringing you my life. I'm bringing you my kids. I'm bringing you my family. I'm bringing you my finances. I'm bringing you my health. Come on, I'm bringing it all to you because you told me, bring it and lay it on the altar and give it to me as an offering. And I'll show up and I'll do great things in your life. Amen. Come on, let's pray today. Father, we love you. God, we love you. God, we love you. God, all over this house, God, I know that there's some amazing people. God, that they love you with all their heart. And Father, but I also know that there's many here today in different places in life with huge need. And Father, I know that there are needs that they can't make happen on their own, but God, I know that you can. And Father, just like you did for Hannah, God, I believe that you will do in our lives today because you're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Father, speak. Touch our hearts today. And God, let us be people that would love to be in your presence every chance we get. God, that we would crave to be with you, Lord, and experience those altered moments and know who you are fully. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, you're here this morning. And you'd be very honest and say, you know what? speaking to me today. God was speaking to my heart. I've been very frustrated and disillusioned, aggravated, maybe even angry. And you would say, today, I realize that no matter what it takes, I want to be in His presence. Come on, and you say, that's me. I want to lay my things down, the stuff, the sin, the things that come to hinder, the problems, the things that need to be overcome. And you say, that's me. Come on, be bold this morning. Don't be shy. God loves you today. He just wants you to acknowledge him in your moment. Say, I'm laying it down today. Maybe you're here today and you say, man, I want to bring Jesus my life. I I need Christ in my life. I want to give him my heart today. I want to ask him to forgive me of sin and make me clean. Come on, and you're bold. Come on, slip it up real high. Don't be shy. Come on, yes, 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 yes. Come on, you said, that's me, that's me. I need Jesus today. I'm not necessarily saying I need church. I need. I see you in the balcony. I need, I need God today. I don't want religion, but I want a relationship with him today. And I want to give him a heart. Come on, let's pray. Father, we come to you today. And God, we lift our lives to you, Lord God. We lift our hands representing a heart that longs for you. Father, we ask today that you would wash us from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. God, that you would make us new, Lord God. And those today that said, I need a relationship with you. Your word declares, if you will draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Jesus, we believe that you came, that you died on the cross. You rose from the dead so that we could have freedom and victory in our life. Thank you today for loving us, oh God. And Father, I believe the needs that are represented in this house, oh God. You know them in detail, Lord. And Father, you are moving, God. You are working, oh God. In the Spirit, there are things happening that we can't see with our natural eyes. But God, let us know, Father, that Lord, you love us. You hear us. You see us right where we are today. And we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.